it's almost midday here um, and i have uh, about 12 participants can you hear me yes 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 we can hear you yeah we have yes. about 12 participants on my left we have uh, dr job omondi hello is a uh, is a tutor at uh, maseno university on my opposite side, we, had, we have Dr. Julia Sogega, who works with the National Museums of Kenya. Um, then we have Dr. Frederick Odede, who works with Jaramogi Oginga University, Jaramogi Oginga Odinga University of Science and Technology. We have Dr. Purity Malele from Chuka University. We have Sally Malois from Technical University of Kenya. We have Catherine Japan, who is a PhD student from um, well, University. We have Dossi Lotieno, a student as well, a PhD student at uh, the Jomo Kenyatta University of Science and Technology. Uh, well, I want to welcome our members on board so that we can see, we can, um, <coughs> Capitalize on what we we're gonna discuss today. I know we have time for, uh, later on, maybe after the president has talked, and you know, we will do that. And thank you, and welcome, guys. Welcome to ODD OAAD. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful and on point. Thank you so much, Doctor Philip Kowitis, and uh, that's. For at Kenya now, we have a group of persons also coming together for this self same meeting. Please, before we proceed, I'll just love to, you can mute your mic, please, if you are not speaking or you're not one of the co-hosts. We're having, I don't want to mute everybody, so kindly ensure you mute your mic. Help us with that, please. We'll also try to do the same at our own end here. So uh, that's our Kenyan um, group. They are also watching along with us. This event is going on in four places, in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Zimbabwe, and in China, Shanghai here. And we are all privileged to be around for this particular initiative sponsored by the OAAD as well as other um, organizations. So we are all welcome once again. Permit me to share my screen because I want to go ahead with um, a brief introduction on why we are here. Ms. Victoria, sorry, can I disturb you there? Yes, please. Just Ms. Sharon. Sharon from South Africa. I have um, a few people who have just dropped me a message saying that they are on our YouTube link, but it's not airing. I just wanted to make sure that uh, that is sorted out. Okay, no problem. Um, Prof Edmond, please, did you get that? Yes, I'm on it right now. Let me... Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, please, uh, um, we proceed. Introduction of the OAAD and the event organizers. What are we here for? And what is on point here? That's what we're about going on to. Wow. Second, something is coming up. Okay. So, the OAAD which is the African Academic um, Doctors, the Organization of African Academic Doctors, is a non-profit organization that is open to PhD holders and PhD students of African descent across the globe. It doesn't matter whichever part of the globe you're on, as long as you're of African descent and you're a PhD holder or a PhD student, you are welcome to the OAAD. It's been established as an academic research implementation and development center and our vision is to enhance the quality of life in Africa through research, technology, and innovation. For our mission statement, we are doctoring solutions for Africa and the world. This P2P initiative that is, is one of those ways that we are doctoring solutions for Africa and the whole world. 
Well, for our main objective, we aim to bring African intellectuals together to foster development while engaging the relevant internal as well as external stakeholders. So this is just a brief introduction to the OAAD. We have several um, research platforms currently ongoing, over 40 of them. And um, we'll also make a pamphlet of today's event available so that more information, if you want to reach out to us, if you want to get to know us better, this will be made available as well. So for today's event, that's the paper to product initiative. It's being powered by the OAD, but not alone, alongside with all the organizations. We have the Zimbabwe Young Academy of Sciences, ZIMYAS, the People Made Solutions Group, that's PMSG, Asia Alliance of Learning Organizations, Shanghai Media uh, Learning Organization Institute, Next Level Education Foundation International, that's NEF International. All these partners have come together to bring us this wonderful and exciting program with the aim of transforming research outputs to goods and services. So once again, welcome to each and every one of us that are online for this program or that are at our distinct uh, satellite groups. Thank you so much for being a part of this program. And before we are done with this, we hope that we'll all be impacted in one way or the other. Thank you so much. So moving on, um, we'll go ahead to introduce our speakers. We're going to have three speakers for today. And our first speaker is the president of Dr. ECOD. Dr. ECOD, that's going to be our first speaker for today's event. And um, he'll be tackling, unveiling the initiative. He'll be helping us to unveil the initiative, thinking paper to product in academic research, Dr. Elijah C. Odi. A brief biography, Odi Elijah is a community engagement expert. He's an interprofessional collaboration mobilizer, a project sustainability assessor, a decision support expert, and a zoologist. He also holds a PhD in environmental management. Odi is currently the president of the OAAD, that's the Organization of African Academic Doctors, he is a green com which is a green community of African PhD holders and PhD students as we have introduced globally. And he's also engaged in various national as well as international bodies. So he's going to be our first speaker for today and we'll be tackling unveiling the initiative, thinking paper to product in academic research. Thank you very much. Dr. Elijah, are you on board? Yes, I'm on board. Can I be heard? Yes, sir, you can be heard. Thank Hello, you so Can much. you hear me? I'm on board. Yes, okay, we are ready for you. Great, great. So let me just place my computer well, and then uh, I'll start. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Can't show about that. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So, thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's um, my pleasure uh, this afternoon to be part of this event, and. Um, I am really pleased to, to be called upon to participate at this time. Um, so I was just trying to, to make the Zoom to come up well. Just a moment. Right. Okay. Okay, very good, good to go. So the, it's my pleasure to unveil the Paper to Products Initiative, which has been um, brought forth to us at this time. I have 20 minutes to talk, so I'm just I'm going to take it up from there. So the uh, we're looking at the big picture of everything going on at this moment. And then um, permit me to say that I'm actually uh, 
speaking from our Shanghai venue, uh, because uh, we have venues across the world, Shanghai, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and then you know, South of, no, which was the last one. Um, Modrito will take care of that subsequently. Okay. Kenya. Yes, Kenya, yes, Kenya, our head of it. Yes. So, and um, so I'm reaching us from our uh, Shanghai venue, and I, I'm really pleased to be um, talking on this topic to unveil it. Now, thinking about the paper to product um, initiative, it's looking at the big picture about Africa and how African researchers are faring in connection with what they are doing with the knowledge that is being generated across Africa. Now, the knowledge economy is what is currently driving the world in different um, countries and different continents across the world. It's the knowledge economy is what is reigning. People are no longer doing things business as usual. Now, very much more going on at the moment in connection with using what we are able to learn or what we have generated, the knowledge we have generated, using it to um, be able to bring up the, uh, uh, the, the services that it can provide for the society. And Africa's population, uh, we know now is over 1.3 billion and uh, predominantly young people reputed to have the highest rate of growth globally. Now the continent is dotted you know, with biodiversity hotspots and it's well endowed in terms of social wealth and then the richness that is available within the society, various cultures spread across. And these young people are very active, very hardworking and have the capacity to drive things in different directions. And we all know also that um, Africa is blessed with a lot of natural resources. And the implication of this is that if Africa were a pot of soup, it would be a very tasty pot of soup that is ready to deliver what it has to the world around. And we know that what is required now for Africa to make the progress that is required is that we must be able to generate the kind of resources for the world around us, generate sufficient um, benefits for the world commensurate to our population, which is about 1.3 billion. And of course, in the next few years, as projected by the United Nations, Africa, the population of Africa will also exceed several other uh, uh, continents at the moment that may have more. And we want to be able to develop and, and then generate uh, you know, uh, value that is commensurate to our number. And how are we going to do this? We're going to need to work with what we have. We have people, we have resources, and that means that we have everything that is required for us to generate the kind of uh, value that we wish to be recognized by across the world. And of course, the United Nations, the, the, having developed the, uh, the SDGs, are currently paying attention to ensuring that no one is left behind. But we all know that at the moment, some people are being left behind across Africa. And African families are very much committed to education and human capital development. This implies that um, Africans work hard in whatever they are doing to ensure that they uh, develop themselves educationally and in many occasions up to the highest level of education, which is the PhD. And we know that at this time, having gathered a huge number of African PhD holders, and African PhD students across, who are living across 70 countries in the world, we know that the Organization of African Academic Doctors is ready to drive the process alongside all other partners, uh, to drive the process of converting the, uh, the, the research we are doing into goods and services that can present value to the world around us. And um, uh, we want to call attention to the fact that Africa, although we have this um, huge potential, at the moment, we are not providing uh, the, the, we're not getting the benefits 
to the tune of what we are putting in. Think about it 20 years ago, the World Trade Center was hit by um, uh, uh, you know, a, a terror attack. And these terrorists, they did their own thing, impacting world trade in many ways. But looking over these years till this time, we still find that Africa has not made sufficient progress in this regard of having sufficient value being delivered to us, you know, commensurate to uh, what we are putting in as well. And we believe that we are the ones that should take responsibility to work around uh, creating the value in terms of um, the knowledge we are generating to transform them into goods and services. So we have begun to encourage our people that in every research they are designing from the beginning of it, they must pay attention to looking at what are the companies that could potentially use the, the, the outcome of the research I'm doing. That would imply that in our literature review, when you're doing your research in your literature review, uh, you are going to be looking at things that are more than just what happens within the academic space or the space of academia. You want to be able to look at also the, 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 the entrepreneurship space and what happens within those spaces. And we are calling upon everyone to pay attention because in the years ahead, we are going to be driving the process. It's not a one-off conversation. And in this meeting today, we have several speakers who are gonna be talking from different angles and who have the capacity and experience over the years and uh, gonna be sharing with us. This is just the launch and we are going to keep engaging. We're looking forward that in the next 10 years, we should be able to count the number of people who have been able to start their businesses or entered into the entrepreneurial space, bringing value to the world around them as a result of them having to think crit critically and strategically in terms of bringing in um, um, uh, 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 the, the idea of paper to product when they are right at the design point of their research. We are looking forward to seeing people. Of course, that doesn't mean that you're going to need to resign from whatever job you're doing. You know people who are currently professors in universities, but they don't necessarily pay much attention to the salaries they're getting because the money they get from consultancy and other things associated with it actually is much more than what they need. And we want to also pay attention to the fact that ar around the world, companies every year are providing money. They are you know, earmarking a lot of money for such uh, you know, consultancy services. We want to be able to attract that money to Africa. We want those monies to go to African pockets because in Africa, we know that we have a lot of dependents. Each person that is African has a lot of dependents. Uh, maybe not everyone. Some people have been able to build their families in such a way that they are able to cover in various areas and each person can be sufficient. But for others, we want to be able to support them. And um, to be able to do that, of course, we've um, entered into partnership with venture companies. Um, and at the moment, it's possible that if you're, if once you are assessed and your research all the business you want to build through your research has got the, the, the requirement that shows that you are investor ready. You'll be able to assess up to $50,000 for the expansion of your business. And that is just a, a little money um, that is being you know, discussed at the moment. There is very much more because there are a lot of venture capitalists around the world who are willing to venture out with you and to work on uh, bringing out whatever value you have that is associated with the, the, the project you're doing. And we want to also be able to look into the future and to see that our young people who are coming up and children are no longer putting their minds into thinking uh, merely about graduating from universities and being able to get a job in uh, uh, you know, in, in government establishments or for other companies. We want to be able to keep flogging the minds of our people and ourselves, developing our minds to the point that at the moment a child is getting into the high school or even in primary school, 
they are able to already begin to think of what they are going to do with the knowledge they are getting. Some days ago, I spoke with a nine-year-old boy who is Chinese, and he told me that the vision he has for his life, he's nine years old, the vision he has for his life is to be able to build a warship for China that is bigger than the warship of the United States. This is a child that is nine years old. He's thinking about what he can do and he's thinking very critically about channeling his energy into developing his country. All the African countries, we know that in many occasions, many of the children at that age are not necessarily um, uh, paying uh, much attention to things of that nature, or maybe they are still doing some kind of play, playing around. But I was really impressed to hear that. So ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to begin to look inwards. I know that many of us are young parents, or if you're not a young parent, you have elder, elder, uh, elderly ones who have children. We want to be able to see friends knowing that the PhD you got has some social capital component. You need to prepare it and use that social capital component to influence things around your community. So that tells us that PhD you have is more than just a PhD and it's bigger than what should be used just for teaching in a university or for some engagements around. So we want to be able to see how we can begin to explore these things. Of course, in this time as well, we see that the Organization of African Academy Doctors currently developing another initiative, which is called DSCI, Doctoring, Doctoring Solutions for Communities Initiative. We're going to be partnering with our members across various um, uh, uh, countries, in various African communities to develop beautifully localized human capital development solutions that can drive things in their communities. Ladies and gentlemen, my 20 minutes just expired and I'm handing over to the moderator. Thank you. Very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Elijah. That was actually concise and on point. We so much appreciate all you had to share with us, introducing us into what today's event is about. So thank you once again for that. I'll briefly introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker for today's event is the person of Dr. Edmond Sangayado, and he'll be taking us on entrepreneurship in the age of knowledge, a clarion call. Briefly, Dr. Edmond is an associate professor of marine science at University of China. He holds a PhD in environmental toxicology from the University of California, Riverside, and a BSc in applied chemistry from National University of Science and Technology, Zimbabwe. Edmund has written more than 40 SCI papers and is an editor of several journals. He is also currently the president of the Zimbabwe Young Academy of Sciences. So let's welcome Dr. Edmund for the next talk on entrepreneurship in the age of knowledge, a clarion call. Dr. Edmund, over to you, sir. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful event. Uh, it's the start of a great new things that are going to follow. So today I just want to start off by uh, sharing a parable with you. And I hope this parable is going to provoke us to think deeply about uh, our intentions as we are engaging in research and our intention as we are trying to pursue a career as an academic. There once was a village in the imaginary nation of Wakanda. The village was rich in all kinds of minerals. Each day, the villagers would go down the mines dig out gold, platinum, cobalt, emeralds, you name it. The village had everything. And everyone admired this village because it was so rich. The village elders volunteered to purify the minerals using their soft taught skills. 
they knew how to polish the diamonds they knew the, how to make the gold like so pure that it, it becomes very valuable everyone around wakanda admired the villagers because they were hard workers but there was something interesting about the villagers each villager owned a book where they record the number of kgz mined throughout their life they had records of everything the amount of uh, gold they had mined the weight of the platinum they had mined everything each villager had that book the villagers competed to see who will mine more minerals when a person mined 1000 kgs you will be elected a village elder you will become uh, that uh, revered person who will now volunteer his skills to purify the minerals the villagers didn't sell the minerals anyway instead they gave the minerals to a giant mining company called thanos mining company who were, and this mining company was the only one allowed to determine the mass of the minerals thanos mining company will then give the villager not money but a certificate that states the weight of the minerals the villager had deposited the villagers loved these certificates. They kept the certificates. They proudly hung the certificates in their homes and never once asked themselves what happened to the minerals that they were sweating over. The end. So I'm a scientist. My daily routine involves writing a research paper, reviewing a research paper, handling research papers as an editor, and of course, teaching and conducting research. My bills, my house bills, health bills, everything is paid for by the last two activities, teaching and conducting research. But the first three ones are the one I want to talk, to about, to talk about. In the last five years, I think I've written about 40 research papers. And these papers have been published by big companies like Elsevier, Springer Nature, Willis, and American Chemical Society. If anyone wants to read these articles, well, you need to pay between $50 and $100 to read that article. Now, each of my papers have been read, I think, between 500 to 1,000 times. That means in the last five years, my papers have been read a total of around 40,000 times. What does that mean? It means in my short career, if you multiply fifty dollars uh, by forty thousand or twenty thousand times to be conservative, you realize in the past five years, publishers have made at least one million dollars from my work. But that's not all. I spend three to five hours reviewing a manuscript as a peer reviewer. I volunteer my skills uh, to peer, for peer reviewing. And a person with my skills, I think they charge at least one hour for service. So for my five hours, right, uh, probably I'll just charge $1,000 for that service I'm rendering for free. But now, in the past five years, I've reviewed more than 150 papers. So what does that mean? That means I have contributed for free uh, services which are worth around $150,000. I guess you see what I'm, where I'm going. I am that villager in Wakanda. In fact, I have mined more than 1,000 kgs of different types of minerals and sent them to this Thanos mining company called Scientific Publishers. But that's not all. I'm now a village elder. I now sit among the elders looking at uh, those manuscripts that other people are, 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 are writing and polishing them, handling them, everything. And at the end of the day, I just beat my chest to anyone who bothers to listen that I am one of the youngest village elders in Wakanda. If only I can open my eyes to see what's in my hands. If only I can open my eyes to see that I, I, that I got blisters in my hands mining platinum. I have held platinum, gold, cobalt, and emeralds, you name it, in these weary hands. What do you think could, could be done to help a helpless, tired, and hopeless villager like me? Thank you. Wow. OK, I think it's not only me that said, wow. I can also hear someone else echoing, wow. <laughs> 
that's just like wow thank you so much dr edmund in fact you've given you've given us like food for thought so i'm still trying to wrap my head around thank you so much for the starting from the illustration the instance the scenario and how you just put it on pause that's thought provoking we have the question let's ponder on it what do you think can actually be done to each and every one of us in that situation thank you so much so that was our second speaker please before i proceed if you have questions ensure that you can drop them in the chat box or you can just pen them down somewhere so that because after this after the third speaker we'll be having our q and a session okay so please you can put it in the chat box or you can just pen it down somewhere thank you so i'll be introducing our third speaker now third speaker for today's event is the person of Ms. Shulu Fellow Sharon Shabalala. And she's going to be taking us on the topic, Paper to Products, Changing the Status Quo and Creating Giants. Paper to Products, Changing the Status Quo and Creating Giants. So for her bio, Ms. Shulu is a South African-born serial entrepreneur with conviction to ignite business mindset in our young people, not just the young people, in Africans in people generally. She qualified as a teacher and has her graduate qualifications in the stream of commerce. Sharon has been in the business space as an entrepreneur for over 15 years. Amongst a number of other ventures, she's also the founder and executive chairman of Grooming the Executive. That's the, the link to her program is listed at www.groomingexecutive.africa. So please let's welcome on board Ms. Sharon, I'm quite excited to hear from her. Ms. Sharon, are you there? I'm here, I'm here. Thank you so much, Ms. Victoria. Okay. Lovely. Uh, thank you so, so much for the privilege um, of, um, of sharing this uh, podium with people of your stature. It's a good thing that I'm sitting down because I am shaking like mad to have the audience that I have, but also to share the stage with um, people of the stature of, um, of Dr. Odi and Professor Edmond and everybody else that's, uh, that's on board. Um, it is a known phenomena that um, Africans, we've got a tendency of apologizing even for the good things that you have done or we are capable of doing. So I'm not going to disappoint. I will, I will apologize for not being born during technology time. So every now and then I get a glitch here and there so I'll be shouting for my son to come and help in case I find myself in a messy situation. So please pardon me with that. Um, one other weakness that I have, if I may indicate, is that um, I've, I've done what they call multiple intelligence assessments. And um, the character that comes out very strong about me is communicator. So I struggle to keep to the time. So Ms. Victoria, please. Raise your finger yes, when I am losing control um, of, um, sure. of, of the time allocation that I have. Dr. Okay. Odi, thank you so much for leading the way um, with regard to your introduction. It created some kind of a hype and an excitement in me and I really was looking forward to the engagement. I, I went back and scratched a little a few points from my presentation and edit things here and there. Um, and I felt that I'm really, really get up and, and ready. Oh goodness, then Professor Edmond came. Professor Edmond reminded me why we started the initiative of grooming the executive. I'm not too sure if my excitement is still as bubbly as it was because he brought me back to the reality, to the challenge that we have identified as an organization that we feel is mandatory and utterly, utterly urgent that we attend to. Um, Ms. Victoria, I had sent my PowerPoint presentation um, and I'm not too sure if we'll be able to flight it. It's not mandatory that we flight it because I do have my pointers and quite frankly, I think if I go through the presentation, I might take longer. I'm just going to talk to my points and um, at a later stage, maybe it can be shared with those who may need it. The first part of my presentation was more introdu introducing who we are as grooming the executive. We've got a website that is a lot more elaborate, which is www.groomingexecutive.africa. And it was .africa for a reason. We are an organization that is based in South Africa in Gauteng, Johannesburg. 
with a very clear understanding of um, our role in a broader scheme of things and not limited and limiting ourselves to South Africa. We understand our obligation as a people, as a community, to make sure that if we find a solution for one of us, it has to benefit all of us. So we are Dot Africa for a reason. Based in South Africa, we chose to be Dot Africa because we understand our obligation. Just in short, people who have had the privilege or the opportunity to go and look at our website, I just want to rush quickly on our logo very, very swiftly. Our logo will represent a tuxedo that is pink in color. And the reason behind it is because for the longest time, when you ask anybody and everybody, especially the young generation, to explain to you who an executive or what an executive looks like, in summary, they would describe a man. They would describe somebody who is of a male stature. And a person of a female stature did not feature as much in a definition or a description of an executive. Now we are mindful that positions like this come with roles and responsibilities, challenges, a lot of tears, a lot of falling, a lot of picking yourself up. And as a result, females in our nature, we tend to shy away from those kinds of challenges because we don't take, take ourselves as worthy. Gumi the executive is saying, we are equal in the battle that we are facing right now. Male, female, young and old, we need to stand up and be counted. We don't want anything that comes with the challenges and the privileges of being an executive to be taken away so that we can accommodate women. Women are equally, equally capable. So in the discussions that we have, we shy away from color, we shy away from gender, we shy away from age, because we strongly believe that the persona of an executive is embodied in anybody who raised their hands and want to take part. Why am I having this talk today? I'm very, very privileged and honored to be given the platform and to be given a lot more time than my previous pre-speakers. Um, pre but the reason why we are having this, uh, this, uh, this conversation today is that um, we know that we've got a lot of academics who have done the hardest work, who have invested their hard earned um, qualifications and conducted so many researches, um, inform, informed and well-researched kind of documentations that have been put uh, down that are based and um, supported by knowledge, that are supported by fact. And the truth of the matter is for the bulk of us who do not have that privilege, we seem to be separate the, separating ourselves from the enjoyment of the work that has been to, put together by these privileged, knowledgeable, and more intelligent people, um, and not knowing how to bridge the gap and access the information. But equally so, the academia who are privileged enough to have received the best education that very few of us will ever enjoy, um, I seem to be cut. Am I still there, Ms. Victoria? Yes, I just started sharing your PPT. Okay, all right, all right, fantastic. You can just so flow. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to go. I think we are now on slide number six. That's where I would want us to go. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Education today and why is it necessary? Thank you so, so much, Ms. Victoria. So, so okay. in, es in essence, and that's a slide that you just missed. We can go back to that. Okay. The grooming executive. The next slide. Okay, fantastic. Let me just continue talking. Um, this is this yes. supposed to be the next slide that, uh, that we need. Um, okay. Now, the knowledge that has been earned by a privileged few of us, um, please go down, I'll tell you when you are on the right slide, that has been earned by a privileged few of us has to be taken to the next level that allow us to build legacies, that allow us to enjoy a lot more um, than what we are already presenting. Slide number seven is where we are at, right? The knowledge yes. that we have is supposed to be used to solve problems. It's supposed to be used to open opportunities, to create legacies, and to be utilized for the benefit of broader than just the people who have it um, uh, achieved it. Now, the question is with that knowledge that we have perfectly, this is, what, um, this is what we have. Is education important today? Do we really believe that education is important today? 
education is utterly, utterly important um, today more than it has ever been before. Many economies are built on the back of fact. They are built on the back of knowledge. They are built on the back of intelligent engagement. And that's what makes education very critical. The unfortunate reality of the matter is though that in the days that we are living in, a lot more educated young people who have not reached the level of, um, of, of your stature, most of the people that are on this audience, on this audience, don't seem to be enjoying the benefits of the education that they have received. As a result, this leaves a whole lot of confusion in the young generation as to what it is the value of education presents to, to, to them. Now, if we all agree that education is important, we are now in a stage where we need to ask ourselves, what then do we do with the education? And the concept of from paper to product becomes more prevalent and more relevant at this point in time. It is the time for us to explore relationships that allow us to breathe life into the theory, into the knowledge that have been encapsulated and put um, well-organized, so uh, put in books that some of us are not even able to access. Like Professor Edmund has indicated, some of his researches, you have to pay uh, what half of us might not even afford to access. And that is the knowledge and the information that can breathe the new change that we need as a people. We need to bring what you have worked hard on to life so that a young person that is getting educated can see the value in the education. But equally so, mindful of the fact that you have invested your time, especially you who have reached the level of academia that you are right now, um, who are part of the OAAAD, um, is that at a certain point of your retirement, your hard earned work should continue to benefit you. Exactly what Professor Edmond has indicated, that once you have ceded the rights to your intelligence, to your hard work, seemingly you have ended your opportunity to continue benefiting from it. And as a result, it is discouraging for young people to elevate themselves to the level of knowledge that you already have been elevated, but equally so, discouraging to you who is already empowered to continue feeding us with the information so that uh, you also can continue benefiting from it. It is for that reason that organizations like ourselves and yourselves, grooming the executive and the organization of academic uh, African doctors need to find a way of collaborating and talking to one another. Because what you have done is half the hardest work. You have done the necessary research you have given us the necessary information where a daring mind, a gutsy mind that you might not necessarily be because not all of us are, are jack of all trades um, or quite frankly, majority of us cannot even afford to be jack of all trades. The gutsy ones and the intelligent ones like yourself find the common ground through which we can take your already contributed researches, informed, intelligent concepts and breathe life to them so that we can solve the, um, the challenges that Africa faces at this point in time. Together, we definitely can take what you have and what we have and make something um, that would potentially bring Africa into the, the position that we want it to be. Where to from here? It is unfortunate that majority of us have not developed the level of trust. Um, you know, um, some African countries have not experienced what we in South Africa have experienced in the nature of apartheid. Um, and sadly, majority of us people of color, we still are stuck in blaming the apartheid era and not taking up the baton and running with the opportunities that are, that are presented to us. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of legacy that comes as a result of the history that some of our um, um, countries have gone through, one of which has been to create a level of distrust between the existing communities. And that's what we need to bridge. We need organizations that are prepared to, to alleviate or look over the historic um, narratives that says black people cannot work together. Black people would want to pull each other down and start and rewrite the script of saying, how do we bring together the knowledges that we have from the different backgrounds that we have and have the institutions like AOAD feeding institutions like grooming the executive so that together we can breathe life to the work that has been done so that 
together we can make it easy, organization like ourselves, to bring to life well-informed business concepts that makes and uh, um, ensures that we don't find a lot of failures in the business initiatives that, um, that, that are brought to, to book. Entrepreneurship and business um, um, streams are very difficult. They are very challenging. And they are a lot more difficult and challenging for us people of color because we don't have a history where you've got an uncle or a relative or a mentor that was born in the space of business who literally is able to lift you up. We all start from the ground. But if we start from the ground that is solid, that is built on knowledge, that is built on information, that's built on research, which is the part that you have already done, it will ease the pain that we have to undergo to correct our economic situation and make sure that Africa and the whole world enjoy the best that we are able to, 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 to provide. Um, His Excellency, the late president of, uh, the first um, president of South Africa under the, the freed um, country that, that we became, Mr. Mandela, said it always seems impossible until it's done. When we started grooming the executive, we really saw the hardships. We saw it almost impossible. But we've been encouraged to find institutions like yourselves who have done half the work that we are not able to do. And we can only hope that to ease the path, the two um, communities are able to find one another, trust one another enough to bring the best that we have together so that we can see progress and see ourselves into a better future. In closing to the people that really are intelligent and, and have conducted the researches that we're hoping that we will tap into the um, communities of AOOD, it is very sad for, for some of us to have made the observation that people of intelligence, when they get to the level of, um, of retirement, they disappear into the thinnest air. People who have got the brains. You know, in my community, when we've got funerals and weddings and we're looking for speakers, we've got few cousins that are doctors in medical field and them. And we choose them like, no, no, let Dr. So-and-so talk. Because that's what we see as the social capital that you have, the work that you have. We need to take that and translate it into developing economy and leaving legacies, both for the continent, both for the country, but more importantly, for you and your family. I'm going to wrap up at that point in time um, because I would definitely go on and on with regards to what we can do together. I hope this gives a glimpse of what we hope um, as Grameen the Executive we can achieve together and achieve for ourselves, but more importantly, achieve it for the continent. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharon. That was very, very insightful. Reminding us once again that we have the social capital and amidst um, all the differences we may have, we also have those things that can come in together as strength, especially in the African continent. When you look together, even if it may seem like weaknesses, we can harness it as strength. And uh, also the benefits of collaboration, relationship, fostering that together. So thank you once again for that. So we've heard from our three speakers, Dr. D, Dr. Edmond, and Ms. Sharon. Now it's time for our Q&A session. It's time for our Q&A session. Please, I'd like to encourage each and every one of us, you can drop your questions. And if you wish to ask verbally, please, um, you can use the reaction button on Zoom. Just give us a hand up or a thumbs up, and I'll know that you wish to ask a question. OK. It's time for our Q&A session now. And we are, from the insightful lectures or discussions we've had so far, I'm actually expecting several questions from those of us on board. Or um, those of us also connecting from our satellite groups, please, if there are questions coming forth, we want to hear from you guys. We want to hear from everybody. You can type your question as well to the um, chat box. I'm busy checking that at the moment. And you can also use the buttons to raise your hand. Yeah, um, Evelyn, Undi, yes, this is the chance to ask your question verbally. And if you want to type, that's also good. So either way, Evelyn, you have a question. Okay, please, you can come up. You can unmute yourself. Okay, your can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, first, I would like to thank to uh, to give my thanks to all the speakers. You have all um, given such a great input. 
Uh, my name is Evelyn and I'm a PhD student. This is my fourth year here in China. And my research area is monetary policy. Well, my first question goes to Professor Edmund, if I'm, I'm phrasing you correctly. I'm really impressed. I'm such in shock to really hear from someone who has really accomplished such much in research area. So first of all, I, I would just like to know if you could just briefly tell us how did you acquire such skills? Because you can't believe how many 40 years I'm telling you right now, the way I'm struggling to publish even a single paper, you know, because we have spent like three years studying all type of coursework that I, I've been studying in my master's, but we have studied them again. And besides that, I really, I really don't understand all these coding stuff because of the nature of education that I had back home in Africa. You know, back home, we just study theoretically, you get it. So when you come here and the professor just leave all the work to you, or you just say, okay, Google this, search this, do this. Then you start to learn, oh, what is Ara Studio? You go on YouTube, you go on this, you waste such great time. So it's really difficult to finish in four years, as they say. And because of this, most of us PhD students, we have this, I can say mental breakdown. I can say that because you, you, you find yourself in a dark place. There's no one to help you. Here in China, everybody is independent. It's not like back home. We work together and all that. You ask a Chinese student and you just say, oh, go, go, go. Uh, you can watch this video. They won't even spend five minutes with you to help in school because that's how they are taught. They work everything independently. So I really like to get a word from encouragement from you all. I really need that because I'm really in a very difficult um, moment in my research. And another thing is, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's a suggestion or advice to uh, organization of Africa Academic Doctors and another organization, sorry, I did not get the name, the lady that was speaking previously. Um, for you guys, I know you have a very great, um, how can I say? Uh, goal to achieve to join us all together, and that's why you include her PhD students as junior researchers. I would suggest that if you can put um, um, how can I say, put a, a category in your organization that would be like maybe advice, like for people that because here we are meeting different people, there are such great people, such as Professor Edmund, so that for us PhD students, if maybe we need advice in our research or encouragement, somehow we can go to talk to such kind of people because it's not easy to meet uh, someone in, in your field, you know, because uh, for example, in my school, we are like the first international students, you know, so there's no one to go through and ask Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Evelyn, thank you. Please, uh, Dr. Edmond, Ms. Sharon, can you guys respond to that, please? Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, the first thing, uh, like uh, what she's asking about how to um, establish yourself as a researcher, especially in a foreign country. Uh, what I wanted to, like, Today's conversation is mainly about how you can become more entrepreneur, right? How can you become more enterprising when you are confronted with problems? So the first question that I'll ask you is, do you think other uh, international students are facing the same problem, right? Are other international students facing similar challenges? If yes, what can you do about it? Right, so you starting from there now, you can start thinking about how can you address that particular problem. We are saying most students who are coming from Africa to China or wherever they are going, they don't have the hands-on uh, experience for some of the technological requirements they are going to meet here. So how can you address that? That's a, a, a business you can start to pursue right now. So that is kind of, uh, uh, in this forum, I think that's the answer that I can give her. How can you address that? And how can you make that a business opportunity? Okay, thank you. Ms. Sharon, you have something to add 
Okay. I would like to add to that, and I, and I think I'm, I'm happy that uh, Professor Edmond has laid the foundation of saying, um, can we start thinking business um, versus uh, the traditional way of doing things? It, it gives me comfort because it's a space that I come from. Um, I, I'm also very privileged to have had a little bit of OK education, and I look at um, how my peers um, still believe that there's a solution for them and not finding a solution for ourselves. So my, my, my suggestion would be, you know, academic people, we really need you. We need what you have done so far. And I'm not too sure how wide open and receptive the world is for your academic knowledge. But as entrepreneurs, as people that are trying to revive the economy, there are people, as people who are seeing Africa with all its potential, but not being uh, fully fulfilled, we need you to start opening your head um, uh, and your thinking around, if I've got a hindrance here, if I've got an obstacle here, can I change the direction so that I still achieve what I want? So, you know, with people who have done this much um, as, 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 as the, the, the lady was, was saying have done, uh, which I'm not very privy to because academically I've got my own limitations, um, you know, are they open to finding out what it is that we can do with what they've already achieved so that a person does not end up feeling des uh, desperate and despondent because there's a whole lot that we believe that the academic um, community is holding to themselves without knowing that it can benefit them beyond just achieving and attaining um, levels of publications, as um, Professor Edmond okay. has said. One is mindful of the fact that we've got career aspirations that are uh, very subjective and personal, but as well, we've got the realities that the times we are living in are presenting to us. None of that should be a reason for you to not feel fulfilled. We need to start being open-minded and looking at a totally different direction versus what we anticipated for ourselves because the times are dictating so. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, in a quick addition to that, if former Akiridul asked, is it every research that can become product slash service? Is it every research that can become product slash service? Can I answer that? Um, yes, and and I'm, I'm, I'm answering it without knowing what kind of researches are out there. You know, there, there, is a, there is a misinterpretation of two critical words in the space of business, entrepreneurship and business mindset. I've done a, a program with one of the prestigious universities here in South Africa where they, they, it's called um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship grooming and, um, and, and business mindset um, creating. Now, there's one thing that needs to be clarified very, 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 very quickly so that people don't get confused. Entrepreneurship is not taught. It can never be taught. Um, business mindset is what can be taught. Now, an entrepreneur is able to take a banana and instead of going to go and sell it as a banana and they turn it into a banana yogurt, there's an entrepreneur. A business person will take the banana and go set, uh, sell it for 50 cents more so that they can make a profit. Now, not many people are born entrepreneurs. A very small handful um, of people have got the, the natural entrepreneur skill, but business can be taught. As a result, on the back of having a well-informed documentation about a concept, an entrepreneur can easily find an opportunity to make a business out of that. It is finding the entrepreneurs. It's, and, and these are people who have got a very huge risk appetite that very few people have, that are able to go to all the lengths to understand, to turn things around and understand what the risk and the opportunities are. On the back of that, knowledge on the back of having identified those people or when they raise their hands entertaining them engaging them i hold a view that almost every product um concept that is on paper yes. well thought through well applied could be turned into business okay thank you so much sharon that was on point okay um aaron s pitman can you come on with your questions please oh, please make it brief so and concise thank you Thank you so much. Yeah, my question has to do with uh, grooming the executive. We that in academia, how can we translate to the corporate world to be an executive? How can we use this idea we have learned in academic, in the executive world? Thank you so much. 
Yes, okay. I'm going to take that that uh, that question with excitement. Um, and once more, what I do at my personal level and what we encourage our team to do is to unpack things and not take words and concept in their broadness because there's a broader meaning in, in, in what we have consolidated in one word. If we can entertain the thought that an executive is not a person that sits in an office, in a glass office that overlooks the freeway, if we can appreciate that an executive is not somebody who is in the top floor of the highest building through whom you can access after talking to 27 PAs and secretaries and, and, and. If we can bring it to the level of reality and say, me in my small garage, having started this kind of a small business, I'm an executive. It will make it easy for a lot of us to see ourselves as executives. The definition of executive has been embroiled in a, in, in, in a space that seems far too rich as a result, not being able to be comprehended by a person who feels that I am not worthy. Through uh, our existence um, of almost four years now, we have people who have started seeing themselves as farmers by being executives of their farms and starting to treat themselves as that, as decision makers, as bosses, as employers, as people who are enabling on behalf of other people. So academic people, okay. it's very, very easy for us to start seeing ourselves as executives the moment we make a decision that we are. Okay, okay. thank you very much for that. Um, I, I believe the, the person that asked the question, you've gotten your response. Okay, from the chat, we have a question here. It says from Gladam Dubé, how can we build trust to collaborate across borders? The talent is scattered across nations. How can we harness these skill, skills to build solid business models while we are best in different locations? Dr. Edmond, can you help us respond to that, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. So uh, right now, I'll, I'll try, start off like at international level. Uh, UNESCO is, uh, is, uh, came, up, came forward with a, with a program uh, of uh, global knowledge networks. So what happens with global knowledge networks, it has been successful, particularly in health, where uh, a group of people uh, from, I will specify in South Africa, there was a partnership with the uh, investor of Visa uh, Grant, where they talked to their former students who were scattered around the world. Right, and these students uh, formed a network. The job of the network was to come back to uh, to South Africa, train health skills across South Africa. So that was how they they uh, organized their knowledge the network. The center was uh, the uh, School of Medicine at uh, at Vitz. That's how they, and a similar program, I think, was run at the University of Zimbabwe. So you can see now it's all institution centered, right? Where okay. a particular institution has cre created that platform for other people to, to work on. Then there is a different now type of platform like OAAD, where you are saying it's a group of people coming from the same background and they form that network right with a specific goal of creating uh, specific products and, and services so it is now the like with the partnership between oad uh zimbabwe young academy of sciences grooming the executive it's that uh, kind of partnership now that is bringing different uh knowledge centers to create uh, different products and services across Africa. So that's another way that is like, this is kind of like one of the major ways that was recommended by uh, UNESCO's knowledge, uh, global knowledge network. So those are kind of okay. the, the ways that we can handle it, that we connect uh, using different uh, centers of thought so that we can create some interesting products. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Edmund for that response. Um, the question here says, do you have suggestions on funding opportunities slash business models for this approach to work for academic work? Um, Dr. Elijah, please, did you get that? Yes, I heard it, can you hear me? Yes, yes the question says, do you have suggestions on funding opportunities slash business models for this approach to academic work? Yes, there are many of such, many, when I was speaking, I highlighted 
that OAD also has actively sought collaboration with venture capital companies, and not only venture capital companies, also we have one now that is dedicated to Africa, which is called Get Funded Africa. And one thing that Get Funded Africa does is to, uh, in fact, because of the long-term engagement they have maintained and the relationship they have built over the years with investors, they are now serving as a hub for venture capitals, uh, of venture capital companies to come together such that they have a lot of money already from various venture capitals who want to, you know, they want to invest, but they have built trust over time. So, so those capitals expect them to serve as a both uh, pass through point where everybody they are going to fund could come through. So actually, uh, we can be. Okay, sorry about that. I think there's a slight disconnection somewhere. Yes, I'm back on. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. Oh, Please okay, go okay. ahead. Yes. So in responding to availability of funds, we can say that we have hundreds of venture capitals that are able to provide funding. Okay. And millions of dollars are available for access. Of course, usually for the access to happen, the, the, the business needs to be certified as investor ready. Now, Get Funded Africa also found that, um, that um, uh, many people who have business ideas actually are not investor ready. So they have also opened a product or a service that provides training for people that have ideas so that their ideas can be transformed into ventures that are investor ready. Uh, so so uh, as Africans, we are not giving room for any loopholes. We are leaving no stones unturned when it comes to that. And the second aspect of the question, which talks about how that could be, you know, in terms of business models, how that could be available for academics. Actually, I, I discovered when I began to explore business models and explore the world of business and entrepreneurship, because I intentionally had to take my mind off at some point to begin to pay very much attention to that. So sometimes I may not actually see myself as a, as a I haven't published so many papers like uh, Professor Edmond, mm -hmm. yeah, because I'm, <laughs> I am, I'm investing a lot of my energies into exploring these other angles and intentionally pushing it to, to become very real to academic people because I've got a PhD as well. In fact, I'm also, you know, I have a, a second PhD, which I'm finishing. So I want to be able to okay, show, sure. yes, I want to be able to show that, yes, the, for, for the business model, the, yeah. the, the, the similarity that exists is that same way you identify research gaps when you are doing research, because every research is built on a research gap. That's the same way in in make business model. You need to un uh, understand the gaps that are available in you know uh, uh, in, in the lives of people. So whatever your research is, it definitely can have a business model developed on it. As long as you identify what gaps can it fill in the lives of real people, what problems do people have that can that your research can you know can. Um, uh, can solve. In fact, in the days ahead, we're going to organize more of these talks and we're going to dedicate some days specifically for okay, you know, discussing business models, launching from the academic ideas, you know, how to develop business models from academic ideas. So you can bring specific topics or specific research areas, your field, and we'll dissect it and show how it can become a model that can be a business that people can sign into. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elijah. So meaning this is just like the, this is just the launch. This is like the icing on the cake. Very soon we are getting down to the hands-on activity. Okay. So let's all get ready and sit tight for that. Um, Bella, I saw your hands up. Are you still willing to ask your question? Bella and Nuli, are you there? 
Okay, let me take another question. Hello? Yes, 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 I'm here. Okay, please go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you so much. I want to thank the organization of uh, academic doctors for coming up with this initiative. Actually, my question has been asked in, in regards to the area of funding. And uh, I'm coming from the background of research and development. We have really developed a lot of products. Um, working with Ferrari Institute of Industrial Research here in Lagos. And uh, the issue of funding is really what we are having issues with, like us researchers who want to bring out our results into a product, market-driven product for commercialization. So that has been addressed, the issue of funding. But I'm also asking, how can we, is the fund, is the Get Funded Africa their fund, is it really accessible for us to, uh, to get? And also, uh, I want to know, I, do, I want him to throw more light on, on the business certified as investors ready. How can we ensure that our business is as certified as investors ready? Because some, some of us that are really into uh, small cottage business or starting up, wanting to start up a business, how can we certify our businesses to have that investors ready uh, tag on it? Thank you. Okay. So, yes, Ms. Sharon, I can see your hands up already. Yeah, um, Ms. Veronica, can I, and I know that we've got to talk about funding uh, that is coming, which I'm very excited to listen to. But can I, can I um, be a bit of uh, an excited damper? I'm an analyst by trade. Before jumping into entrepreneurship, I, I dealt with a lot of investment opportunities where I was dispersing money. Um, I jumped into entrepreneurship thinking that uh, I know it all, I understand it all, and there are institutions that are ready to fund me. Can I lay this foundation that I want all of us to take home and apply ourselves to? The venture capitalists, the funders, the banks, everybody else that is in the funding space, they've got a very limited risk appetite compared to what you have as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. With the question that we were asking back then as an investment analyst, and the question that I'm asking myself out of the knowledge and having walked the talk is, have I taken away the elements that are risky that a potential investor might not necessarily want to be associated with? And how do we take that away? By starting with what we have. You start where you are. You action on the concepts that you have in a very contained, limited risk exposure manner so that the next person that is supposed to be disbursing their money feels the comfort that the bigger risk has already been taken by you and has been addressed. Now, if we've got concepts as entrepreneurs, as business-minded people, by the time we say we are looking for a funder partner, we need to have asked ourselves and answered satisfactory that I have taken away, I've taken with what I have, addressed what could be seen as the risk and know the risk, flag them, show the investor that you know the risk and you either have addressed them or you've got a mechanism that is going to address it. No funder, no funder whatsoever has the biggest risk appetite equivalent to what we have as in entrepreneurs as well as business people. So when we go out there, please, let's make sure that we don't come up with an exciting concept. It's only exciting to you. It's not exciting to the funder. The funder wants to see the return on investment and they want to see it faster. Make sure that you have gone beyond the space of excitement and saying, I'm very certain this can be done. And how you test that, you test, you test it with your own. Just quickly, I'm a farmer in my other space. I've got a hectare of 100, uh, 100, 100 hectare of sunflower that I farm with my sisters and my mother. And somebody says, Sharon, how did you get to that point? Did anybody find you? And I started to appreciate that we really do not understand the concept of building ourselves. I started by farming vegetables in my mother's backyard. And when I started to sell my cabbage and there was excitement, I went to my grandmother's yard. Now in my community, there are people who had bigger yards and they were not taking care of them. All I asked for was, can I clean your yard and I can have half of it so that I can start uh, planting my carrots. And I started to grow my potential to supply by going and starting with what I have. 
it might not necessarily be a relevant narrative, but it's as simple, the, the simplest way to bring it to the level of saying, start with what you have, eliminate the risk, give the funder the comfort that you have addressed or identified the risk and you know how you are going to mitigate it. Okay, thank you so very much. All, uh, so Victoria, may I just mention that on okay. the 24th of September is fully dedicated to funding issues, funding related things. Yes, so prepare yourself and subsequently we'll be having a lot more to deal with that. There'll be trainings, there'll be, you know, we're not in a hurry. We are going to deal with this matter very, you know, uh, centrally. Thank you. Okay, okay. So please let's take note of that. I've also um, shared a link on the chat box. Please, if you have more questions, you can just send it to that link. Then um, let, let's just take one last question. We have several questions in the chat room, but please pardon us. We won't be able to actually take all of them. So you can just send it to the link uh, that I've shared. Um, Gladman, do, I think we've answered your question. Okay, from Janja, he says, here academics are bringing the ideas. Now, are there any perspectives for the possible role of the African government leaders? Are they motivated to support this kind of initiatives? Now, this is a huge question. So please, let's hear from our, let's hear from our resource persons. Okay, okay so I, I'm more conversant about the conversations in Southern Africa. Uh, I know in Zimbabwe, there is now what's called term to educate, education 5.0, where the government is trying to drive towards uh, an education that pro produces products and services. That is kind of the initiative that is being run right now where uh, universities are asked to establish innovation centers where young people can participate in creating products, right? So that is kind of uh, the end uh, in Zimbabwe. Then in South Africa, I know there is um, what's called the 4IR, right? Uh, that is kind of the push these days where you, uh, there is a push for towards innovation, not just uh, creating uh, dried mango, but trying to make something that is really kind of out there in innovation. Rwanda, Rwanda is a push towards that again, where they are emphasizing a technological, uh, technological innovation and biotechnology, those kind of kind of the focus in Rwanda. Then uh, in Ghana, there's kind of those conversations, but I, what I noticed was mainly centered on uh, addressing environmental issues. So yeah, so you find that in, 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 in Africa, we have those conversations, but what is missing is that, um, what can I say, the interaction between science, government and business there is no platform for that conversation to happen. So like, for example, in Zimbabwe, we have the education 5.0, but it's an idea which came from the government without interaction with the scientist or the business. So if the scientists, the ones that are supposed to create the product will be just watching, so, okay, what, what are we supposed to be doing? And everyone is trying to figure out well, how do we fit in into the government's plans? So it's, I think that kind of top down uh, management is kind of what's happening across Africa, where it just imposed on us to do something. So the, for us now, I, I, I'm glad we have uh, Ms. Sharon and I think um, other speakers will highlight that as well, that it's now up to us. This is what the government is doing, but it's now up to us to start to, uh, to rip what they use, the whatever platform that the government have used, how do we uh, use that for our own good here. So it's now up to us just to reach out to them because they, if they are going to continue the top-down kind of governance. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Edmund. So with that, I believe we've come to the end of our speaking session from one to a. So please, if you are there, you can use the emoji button, give our speakers a thumbs up, a clap, They've done quite impressive. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sharon, Dr. Edmond, and Dr. Odi. We appreciate you guys. So we're moving to the next thing on our agenda, which is the panel session. We are about having our panel session. Just a second. I want to share my screen, please. Okay. 
So for our panel session, it's going to be an interesting one and I'm quite excited about it. We'll be tackling on benefits of God's, benefits of God playing two worlds. Benefits of God playing two worlds, life as an academic and as an entrepreneur. And for our panelists, we are having Ms. Sharon again, and I'm glad to introduce Dr. Loretta N. Ofodile. So let's get to know her. Dr. Ofodile is the chief lecturer at the Department of Biological Science, Yaba College of Technology. She's presently the director, College Central Research Laboratory, the chairman, Women in Technical Education and Employment between 2012 to 2016, and the head Department of Biological Sciences, Yaba College of Technology. She is a botanist. And she has over 35 scholarly articles in both local and international journals. Interestingly, she's the, she is the chief farmer of LTV Farms Limited and has mentored many young people and retirees. And the link to how pression is below www.ltvfarm.com.ng. So let's all welcome on board Dr. Ofodile. Okay, she's here. We're glad having you on board, ma'am. And also let's welcome Ms. Sharon, whom we've gotten conversant with over time now. Are they on board? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we are here. Thank you. Okay. So we're ready for our yes, panel. Thank you very now. much. Happy to be here. Great, great, great. So we have we are we are set and um, we can get the ball rolling. So to our panel session now. The first question we're going to we've heard so far from our we've heard so far from our speakers. And the discussion has been building up and building up and down. This is the point that we're actually going to sit down and trash it one by one. So for the first question now, we are conceptualizing a research that is market driven, okay? We've, most of us, we've been doing these researches, but now we're getting to a point that we want to actually sell it out as a business idea. How do we actually go about this? I know Dr. Elijah has already briefed us that on 24th September, something good and hot is coming and it's going to be wonderful and juicy. But okay, at least let's have the appetizer. How do we go about this? So please, um, Dr. Sharon, you can respond. Are you there? I was hoping that uh, Dr. Lorette would be um, yes. starting um, so that we okay. can give her space, yes. Okay, but we, actually, we want to hear from the both of you. So please, Ma, okay. Dr. Loretta, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon. I, you have actually given me a lot of food for thought mm. for your presentation. And uh, uh, Dr. Eli uh, Professor Elijah and uh, Edward and uh, Dr. Odi. I am here not because I have, uh, uh, there are no, other persons who have been able to build big businesses in Nigeria. Around me, even among my colleagues, I know there are a lot of my colleagues who have built businesses, but I think I'm here because we are talking about from pro, uh, paper to product. Uh, that my business has been uh, from the work I have done in research, being able to uh, start up something like Dr. Sharon said, she said, start where you are. It can be from your garage. So how did this idea come about? I would use myself as an example. Uh, having an entrepreneurial mind while conceiving the research, so how do you, where is this investigation going? Where is it going? Is it going to end in paper alone? Is it going to solve a problem? So for you to start up a business from your research work it has to come from the idea stage the idea stage. You must have thought through it, you must have thought out of the box to say, okay, this is the problem. And then by the time I'm through, 
I can solve this problem in one way or the other. For example, we, when I was going to start my PhD, I was thrilled with, I want to solve the problem of uh, diseases in uh, millet and all that. And then my supervisor called me one day and said, see, um, have you heard about mushrooms? Do you know the importance of mushrooms? I said mushrooms, because from my background, we, we never ate mushrooms. My parents never put mushroom into our diet. So what is mushrooms? What is a mushroom and all that? And then I, I, it got me thinking, it took me time. And I started reading and I found out that today, mushroom I regard as treasure in the world. Untapped resource, especially in Africa. So what problems can they solve? And after the research, what am I able to do with it? So I think the first thing is get an idea that you know that has product um, focus that we end in a product. Without that, it's not just product, a service. Like Dr. Odi said, there is no, and uh, Dr. Sharon, there is no research that can solve a problem that cannot end in product um, 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 or service. I think that's where, what I can say for now. Can I add to that, uh, Ms. Victoria? Thank you so much, um, Professor Lorette, uh, Dr. Lorette. Can I correct something? I'm not Dr. Sharon, I'm just Sharon. Um, <laughs> let's, not, let's, not, let's not give me an additional title. It would be nice to have it. Um, Dr. Lorette has put it very succinctly and right on point. Right now, um, the conversation that we need to have and make sure that we all understand is there is no new business idea. There is nothing new under the sun. Everything that you come up with has been tried and tested by somebody somewhere. Probably the time and the timing was wrong or the intention behind it was not thought through. Two critical things in conceptualizing a market ready uh, concept is identifying a problem and finding a solution. Those are the only two things. If in what we are doing, if in the researches that we are putting together, is for the purpose of ticking a box or making sure they've got accolades, that will never translate into a market ready and user friendly business concept. We need to go back, dig deeper and find out what problem we have identified and whether what we are bringing in is addressing and tackling the problem head on to solve it. And until we get to that point, we're going to have so many business concepts and so many failures. And in the world of business, there is the narrative that says one in a thousand businesses will survive the thousand, the thousand day, meaning every three years, businesses die. And the question that people do not ask is why? Why do businesses die? There are multiple questions that need to be asked. But the fundamental question is, was it addressing a specific problem, especially in this day and age? Was it addressing a specific problem and was it coming up with a solution? So that is very critical in getting researchers that are market ready. Let's start finding out what the problems are. You know, and the beautiful thing about that is you don't need to go very far. Start with your community. Start with people that are immediate uh, where you're not going to take uh, longer to sell your concept because what you'll be selling is the problem that they are aware of. And that's what I'm talking about when I say investors are interested in opportunities that have eliminated excessive risk. How you eliminate the excessive risk is identifying the problem that you, you are going to be solving and the solution. Ultimately, the bigger challenges are out and everybody else gets excited because we can translate that into sustainable money-making opportunities. Thank you so much to our resource persons. I think from what the Tobia actually said, we've been able to get the unified idea, get a problem, find a solution. Yes. That's just the key that I've gotten from the Tobia. So thank you so much for that. So now as a sequel to that, we've been able to like how to go about it. But now as an academia where most of us actually fall into, 
how do we now convert this idea to products? I think it's just like a sequel to the first question. We actually want to hit the nail on the head. How do we now bring this idea into the product form? Dr. <laughs> the way you're actually smiling at me, and he's telling me that we actually, we are, we are doing something. So please, how um, do we make this idea? Um, yes. uh, the, the, the entrepreneurial mindset, Mm. The entrepreneurial mindset, you know, this is an idea. I have investigated it. These are my findings. Mm. What can be done with this finding? Okay. I have an idea. This idea can actually go to the market. I have investigated it. Actually, I just want to mention that you can't stop investigating an idea. You keep moving from one stage to another. I will use the um, LTV farm as an example. We are still eliminating the risk. We've not really gotten funding as we ought to. We are still at that stage. Um, sometimes people will say, ah, why don't you do this? I'll say, we have some things we are still looking at before we can get a product or products that can serve us properly. So you, you, you keep looking at the idea from one stage to another. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I, we, I worked on mushrooms for since 2000, year 2000. Uh, PhD, mushrooms have edible ones, nutritional ones, they have medicinal ones. The, the nutritional ones, just the edible one that can be in everybody's diet. We want it to be in diet of Nigerians because Nigeria, we are not really mushroom eating people because many don't even know you can grow mushroom artificially. They think you just go to the wild and collect the way it has been done in, um, in the olden days. So in the villages, uh, they collect and Eat. And there are dangers of uh, poisoning. So we've looked at that, said, okay, building a mushroom farm will help people understand that mushroom can be made available and accessible. So, but it's not affordable yet. So what are we doing in our investigations to see that it's affordable in this part of the world? In Southern, in Southern Africa, mushrooms are more popular than in West Africa. So what are we going to do? We are doing some investigation. So we are doing skeletal cells production. We are doing OBA production. We, we are training a lot of people. First of all, we have to start with training. Uh -huh. This is finding, this is edible. This is, this is uh, growable. That's the first finding. Then you now say, okay, let's try it out. Set up something small at home. Okay, so you have to, it is the same thing we are saying, get your problem well-defined. Then find out how that problem can be solved. And then what product or service can that problem uh, get into the market? So now find out with that entrepreneur mindset, how do I now convert that finding into a service or a product? That's what. I'm giving you an example with uh, LTV farm. So there are different types of mushrooms. Which one is available to us? What skill can I gain? What skill can I gain in addition to my research to see that that finding becomes a product? So you can do online training. You can do uh, yeah. short training here and there to get yourself to the conference. Able to transform mm. that um, knowledge into a product or a service. So we render both, we have products and we have staff. So we started, we trained a lot of people. So many of them have been able to start their farm. So the intention, when we started, my colleagues said, well, do you have to train? Uh, you, 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 I, I told them, if we don't train people, that means the industry cannot grow. And we cannot have the kind of conversation and interaction we need to build the industry of mushroom in Nigeria. So you start from knowing 
what skills you need to transform that finding into a product. I think I want to stop here. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Um, let, let's get to one thing very clear um, and say that not everybody is born business-minded and not everybody is born entrepreneur. Yes. Um, equally so, not everybody is born with the IQ that some of you are privileged enough to have and reach the academia level that, uh, that you have. What we need to find in converting ideas into product is a point of trust. It's a okay. point where the academia have found a trustworthy institution through which they can share their hard earned ideas and feel comfortable that it can be converted or truthfully be told that it cannot be converted into a viable business concept and feel safe enough that their concepts would not be stolen from them and be used where they are not able to benefit. And this for me is why organizations like OAAD at this point in time is very crucial for people who do not have the risk appetite, nor the know-how of where to start in conducting due diligences, in asking the right questions in line with the sectors that they have researched and be comfortable that their interest is protected through an institution that they trust. You don't know Sharon Chabalala from South Africa. I don't know Dr. Loretta from Zimbabwe, from, from Nigeria, but there's nothing that stops me from talking to her other than trust. I'll be comfortable to talk to her knowing that there is somebody who is covering my bag and making sure that that which I share with Ms. Sharon, that which Ms. Florette shares with me, it is safe. And this probably is a challenge to OAAD to make sure that it is a solid body, that academic academia people are comfortable to come to. It should be the home of comfort, the home of safety, the home of trust where people of academic background are able to bring their hard earned ideas to OAAD and say, under you, I'm ceding the responsibility of taking my concept to the next level. It is on the back of that that you will find comfort from people who have conducted so much research, who have invested so much coming up with their ideas because they're not going to end up uh, in a situation similar to what Professor Edmond has indicated to say somebody else is milking the cow that I have raised and I don't have a say. So the body like OAAD is very crucial and it's coming at a time where we need it the most as communities of entrepreneurs, because that way we will access well-natured ideologies from people who have done the best work. And it will be seated to us where the middleman is a trustworthy um, joinery between ourselves as entrepreneurs and the people who have done the work. As entrepreneur community, we need you. We need what you have done. We want to breathe life into it, but we know that you don't trust us because we are gutsy, you want to make money, you don't know us. And as a result, OAAD, you've got a very, very huge task and responsibility of making yourself that haven of trust and reliability so that both entrepreneurs and the academia can come to your hub and say, what is it that we can do? What is it that we can get from you so that we can explode into a successful formula? Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Sharon, for that. I think uh, one of the key things you've been emphasizing so far is the fact that it's not everybody that is born to be an entrepreneur. Actually, however, you can actually develop the business mindset. Okay. Then from what you're also saying, uh, uh, if I may say, um, bring it on, what I also was able to obtain from that is the academia plus the industry linkage. Okay, so meaning as an academia, you may not necessarily go into the business by yourself, but you can actually share this idea with people that are actually into the business. Yes. Uh, and one of the bedrock of OAAD so far has been collaboration. That's why we've been able to move as fast as we've been able to with so many persons on ground across um, several, no, not just in Africa, across the globe. And then we, we have so many things actually ongoing. So collaboration 
Education has been a key bedrock for us and we're still going further and further. So thank you so much for those wonderful ideas. So now to, we actually tackled two and it's been interesting. So to our third one now, okay, we've had the uh, academic part, we've had the business part. How do we now strike a balance between those two? Okay, I, as, personally as an academia, I was actually struggling finding a balance between so many things I'm carrying on. And now we're not talking about translating it into product, translating it into the business aspect. Please, you guys are doing it. So how do we get the balance? Thank you. This is the balance um, to achieve what? To achieve success in business and academia or the yes. balance to get started? Sure. Uh, I think Dr. Loretta will be the one to answer that. <laughs> I think, Dr. I, I, you know, I keep on saying to people, I envy, I envy women especially who have found the magic in finding balance. Um, I am, I'm shy of turning 50, I'm a few months from turning 50 years old, and I've been in business for the longest time, um, relatively, and I still am struggling with the balance. I think in us, we need to appreciate, I keep on saying, I, I was very fond and very close to my, to my grandmother who, have, um, who has uh, um, passed for over 40 years. And, and, and the one thing that, um, that, that comforts me in, in, in struggling to find that balance um, is the fact that probably there isn't really a balance as such. It's very subjective um, from one person to the next that we have to toil. We have to toil until the time of, um, of, of resting. So really, Dr. Lorette, I would love to hear from you how to find the balance. Um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a very energetic person. I love challenge. I always go out um, to look for ideas. Once something has reached the level of implementation, I feel like I don't have purpose anymore. So I'll go and look for something else. And that is why probably I fall under the category of high risk, high risk appetite people with, um, with a series of um, entrepreneurial concepts, some of which have failed by the way. Um, and I had to stand up, dust off and say, oh, it's okay. I'm going to try again and try something else and fail twice as hard. Um, so I'll say the ratio of success and failure the success side have been on, a, on, on, on the slightly uh, smaller side, but very encouraging and very driven and committed. So really I would like to find a magic in the balance that is there. I thrive on the back of the imbalance that, uh, that I have. Okay, Dr. Laurie, please, we are all excited. I want to hear from you. How do we do Thank this? Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, Sharon has just said it all. It's a continual struggle. You keep, mm. you keep struggling to strike the balance, but uh, especially in this part of, this part of Africa, I, I, we are in Lagos and it's, it, it, it's a very tough thing to keep your business on the high side and the academic um, well um, uh, at um, a satisfactory level. So sometimes, and most of the time, your business suffer because okay. your academia is your primary um, job, is your prim primary uh, profession. So what I do is to make sure I, especially having an administrative um, um, position in my job, uh, you, you, you give out responsibilities and um, Sometimes you suspend some aspect of the business. If you think, like I said, we are still trying to reduce the risk. We are still trying to build the business still coming up. It's not well established yet. So, but this is the real ticking period of, of the business. So you just do that thing that will make sure that the business is alive while you keep on with your job as a, an academic. So um, that's what I can say, but it's very tasking, it's very demanding, and also to balance it with family um, uh, responsibility. So you, 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 sometimes we want to, um, the business drags you because there is um, a lot to do at that time, is to know how to make sure that you keep, for example, this technology, when you are doing online uh, uh, teaching, it makes it easier to think, okay, I want to train people. Why don't I do the training online? Okay, instead of uh, going, doing on-site. So people are on Zoom and you are doing your training 
and say you are going to take your lecture and uh, uh, you, you try to put technology into your business to help you cope. So that's one aspect I, I think is going for us right now. So instead of gathering people together and being there and they're going on the traffic, you, you, you organize an online training. Connected, one man yeah. could be two, three, it's online. So we are utilizing technology to uh, make um, a, a balance between your job and your business. So technology uh, is helping. That's what I would say. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Kodile. Um, I think so far from your conversations, one of the things you've been bringing forth is um, the need to train others that you said earlier on, and now also maybe um, in creating a balance, the need to also bring other people in to assist. Now, I, I would like to figure, find out at the, as you're transitioning academia and business together, at what point do you, can you bring people in? At what point between these do you now be like, okay, I can bring other people either to train them or for them to work along with you? Because Sharon um, also mentioned something about trust. So please, kindly help yeah, us. Yeah, when, when, while, while this is peculiar is that we have drought. We have um, um, little or no knowledge on in that um, industry on how okay. to grow mushrooms. So, that's why we started with that, because if you don't have um, manpower, uh, mm -hmm. the, the business cannot even start at all. You can start it, but who do you employ? Or who will go into the business to, to sustain it? So that's why LTV Farm started with training, because okay. uh, there, there, were, there was drought in skill. No, okay. people hardly knew about it in Nigeria. So we started the training so that um, uh, we can get people. So someone can call me and say, I'm starting my farm. Please, do we have someone who can work for me? So I know, okay, we train that person, that person. Okay, you can um, employ that person. So that's, okay. uh, it's not more of just um, money making. It's more of developing the industry in Nigeria. That's what the business is all about. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, it's been wonderful hearing from you, Dr. Loretta and B. Sharon. Sincerely, you guys have been, you've been so wonderful throughout. So now on, on a last note, what would be your advice to the, those in the academia now? What, what will you leave us with? Can I start? Please, can I start? Please go ahead. Um, as an African nation, um, we, our history has not, allowed us to understand the concept of um, legacy building. Most of us got into business at the time where poverty and need necessi necessitated us to find alternatives. Um, unlike other privileged na and, and nationalities and um, people of different background who were raised in communities that business was, was at the center. I mean, South Africa, the biggest employer, if not government, it is white communities who have been raised and bred in the space of, um, of business. Majority of us black people came in because A, there was a window that was opened, but B, we thought, let's just try this thing. People are thriving, people are succeeding. Sadly, we did not come at a time where we understood that we needed to build. Now, the academic community. Some of you probably are much younger than me. Like I said, I'm threatening 50. We are at a stage where we need to build for longevity, for legacy. We need to be patient. We need to be willing to put a lot more effort for us to match our counterpart whose forefathers put a lot more effort when our forefathers were not open in the space of business. If we start conceptualizing our research and our ideas on the back of building legacy, which we might not necessarily be immediate beneficiaries thereof, which could be opening a new platform for our children so that we cut perpetual intergenerational poverty that black community seems to be carrying from one generation to the other. That will create an opportunity where tomorrow, 
when we might not necessarily be here. We have left our children and our earth in a space where the grounds and the playing fields are leveled for them to compete. Can we walk away with an interest and an, an understanding that it might not necessarily be for our immediate benefit? It might be for the corrective of a bigger intention, but equally so. If anything else is apparent, I would like to leave my children with something that I'm confident they will be able to hold on to and be able to survive. Start from a level that I was never privileged to start from. Can we look okay. at legacy? Can we look okay. at concepts that we can build for tomorrow, not necessarily for today? Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Sharon. We need to build a legacy. Okay, Dr. Loretta, please. What final note are you leaving for us? Yes, uh, legacy, very important. But I would like to um, encourage uh, my colleagues to look at building, starting, starting, stop procrastinating, start something that you can go into, either retiring or resigning. You don't believe that you're going to start after retirement. You're going to start maybe when you resign or you have a reason to leave off your job. Please start something. Every one of us who has a PhD has something from our PhD that can be translated into helping humanity into building legacy. Like I said, Mushroom industry was, was very infant in Nigeria. And I thought in myself that we can build this industry. It's not a very viable big industry right now, but it's grown. When I look back, I know that we've gone some distance forward and that is growing. It's that the generations to come are going to enjoy benefits from this industry. So please, let's start something. Don't say, My, I don't think I have a product. I don't think I have a service. Even if you finish your PhD 10 years ago, think about it, pick it up again and look at it. There is something that is beneficial because no institution can approve a PhD that does not have contribution to industry contribution to the society. So please think about it and start something. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so very much, Dr. Loretta, Ms. Sharon. Please, can we give them a thumbs up, a clap? It's been a wonderful panel session. I think I'll just take from the chat Thank room. Thank you very much. But it's Melo just summarized it for us. He said, he or she said, start something and leave a legacy. As in, he just combined it together. So start something and leave a legacy. That's the watchword we are going to be passing this panel session with. So thank you so much, Dr. Loretta. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharon. We, it's been a wonderful thank session you, so Dora. far. Thank you. So it's been a wonderful session so far. And we have heard from our speakers, we've heard from the panel session, which is, has just come to an end. And I believe we are fully loaded with how the event has gone so far. However, although this has been an appetizer and we are all getting with are ready for 24th September, where we are going to be having the practical side of this event. So with that, we're going to be coming to the concluding or conclusion of the event. And we're going to be getting the concluding um, remark from Dr. Margaret from Zimias. Dr. Margaret Sia. Tia Wamaga. Sorry, please, pardon me if I didn't get the name. So Dr. Margaret, are you there, please? Dr. Margaret from Zim, yes. Oh, uh, it seems like she's no longer connected. Yeah, Professor Edmond, okay. may you please appoint someone else from Zimias or, or yourself? Like someone else. Okay, Mr. Kyo, are you available? <laughs> I 
<clears throat> Mr. Q. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, please. Sorry about that break. Um, is Dr. Margaret around now? Uh, we have someone else. Uh, okay, please. Let's go ahead. Yes, Mr. Q, you can go ahead. Are you available? Mr. Mr. Q, please. Unmit yourself. Hello? Yes. Yes. Um I'm supposed to give um a vote of thanks. A vote of thanks. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, uh thank you for the opportunity to give the vote of thanks. Uh I consider it an opportunity because I was here participating and uh, um, listening to uh, the great contribution uh, from uh, Miss Sharon, because he said you should not call you doc, but I uh, look at you as a doctor. Yes, um, then uh, Dr. Loretta and Dr. Edmond, uh, and also Dr. E. O. D. for the presentation that you have given us. I've benefited a lot. Myself, I'm, uh, I'm in Sweden studying uh, in chemistry for renewable energy. So I've benefited a lot from the discussion, starting from the academic side and how to convert stuff from paper to product. So thank you so much. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Keep bringing us together, uh, working from different places and working with the organization uh, that are like this that are providing a platform for people and academics to take their papers into uh, a product that can help Africa and themselves and their families. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that concluding remark. I believe we are actually very much on time. Like just an applause, we all did very well. So aside from our resource persons, all the participants, those that came on and those that logged out on YouTube and on other resources uh, um, that are joining up for this program, we really appreciate you guys. We appreciate the work you're doing. In fact, without the participants, this program would not be here. So we are saying thank you so much for tuning in. And please, please, please set your dial for 24th of September. It's coming on again and it's coming hot. So before we wrap up, can we kindly open our camera so that we can all get a screenshot of today's event? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I'm so much into that. So that we can get a screenshot of today's event. And then, please, uh, can you just open your cameras? This is Africans doing wonderful things, not just for Africa, but for the entire world. Yes, it's coming on. Wow, wonderful people from all over. And um, we have from uh, Kenya, uh, Kenya location, China in Shanghai. We have from Zimbabwe and we have from Nigeria. I would have really loved for those groups to give a shout out, but let's just take the photos for now. Wow, I can see. Victoria, can you, can you see us in Shanghai? Yes, I can see you all standing. This is wow. <laughs> Victoria, you're going to share the photo. Others, please come over. Come over, Lila. Bye. Lila. I will wear my job. Please, just a second. Let them get set. Yeah. Okay. Come. Yeah. Can you spotlight? Can you spotlight no. us so we can be sure, sure that we have a ring as well? Um, yes. Professor Edmund, please. Yes. Okay. Um, Viola is saying enable my camera. Okay. Yeah, we see that. Okay. okay. Like. Yeah. Dr. Enmore, can you take the screenshots uh, from your end? I can yes. enable my camera. Yes. Please enable all cameras. All cameras open. Please enable all cameras. Just a second, please. Bear with us. We are on it. Okay. Oh.
Just a few minutes, please. We are on it. Almost done. Just bear with us. Please, and then move our cameras. Yes, sir. We are on it. <laughs> But if we do okay. this, we can't see. Uh, Mine is here oh, to be enabled. Oh, oh. Okay, sir. Out. We're almost there. Uh, can anyone just take the screen? Uh, I can't use my keyboard here. Oh, Simon, sorry, you said? I, I can't use my keyboard. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm only seeing the cameras on the first two pages. The third page, none of the cameras are open. So how do we do about that? How do we go about uh, that? You, uh, I think maybe it's the... Uh, whatever they are using to connect. So you can just take a screen from here. Okay. Mine is not, okay. not enabled. Oh. Not yet enabled. We have a Zoom technician in the house, please. <laughs> How can we enable cameras all around? How do you take screenshots? Actually, I've been taking screenshots today, so... Oh, you did? No, please go ahead. I'm just taking random shots all, all around. So as the cameras are coming on, eventually oh, you'll okay. get the one that your photo is in. <laughs> yes, just take... <laughs> Mine is not yet enabled. Wow. Okay. Dr. Raymond, can we proceed? Yes. Okay. Somebody said his camera is not enabled, right? Yes, yes. Many of the cameras are not enabled. What camera? What camera? Okay. Please, we are quite, uh, we apologize for the camera issues. I really, we're trying to figure it out, but I don't know what's happening. Yeah. But if, if, if your face is not showing, at least the name is there. So it's please bear with us. <laughs> okay. So yeah, can we say cheese? Uh, some of us are frowning. Please give us a smile. Today's event has been remarkable. <laughs> yes, that's the family screen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, second. Please don't stop smiling yet. I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. It's. I think I, I've captured all the screenshots from my end. Dr. Edmund, how is it at your end? Have you been able to capture? No. no. It's okay, I think I've taken enough. We have almost like 15 pictures from my end. <laughs> well, one second, one second, please. Can I have the different groups, like the Shanghai, I can see the Shanghai group. Can we get them just alone? Is it possible to get them just alone? Sorry. Okay, I can't see them now. Where is they? You, you can see them. I was thinking to get the Shanghai, the Kenya. Okay, they're, all, they're already taking a screenshot. <laughs> okay, that's great. Oh, that's good. Thank you. So, Dr. Elijah, I think we are done on my end. Over to you, and then we can call it today. Okay. Oh, can you try taking this one? Wait. Go with us. Yes. 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 How about this one? Have you taken Kenya? Have you taken Kenya? Wow, I like this. This is good. Wait, let me take this. I just like come on. Okay, yeah. That's wonderful. But I'm only getting one page. No, no. I haven't. Wow, I just saw Kenya. Okay. 
Oh my God. So can we go sit down? Can we go sit down now? Yes, sir, please, you can. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay. okay. You know, you know, why did you throw a seat? <laughs> and it's the same okay. color as yeah. we're giving them, yeah. <laughs> Okay, everyone, we've come to the end of today's meeting. You're free to interact with each other, collaborate, fun. This is One Africa in one platform, okay. one house. Thank you so very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what happened? Ah. Uh. The one that I played me. Yeah. You asked the question. So the funny thing Africa in New York. So the other duty of